Next, can we please call Martin Taylor? Thank you. Hi, Martin. Um, initially, can we please just ask you for your qualifications and maybe where you're from? I'm from Brisbane, um, but it was um, I'm a I'm a conservation scientist at Griffith University Environmental Studies and a PhD in ecology. Um, so, thank you. Uh, so, if you wouldn't mind, can you please tell us how livestock production has affected the Brigalow Belt, and then perhaps discuss some solutions to some of these problems? Yes, thank you. Um, and you know, it was great to hear Warren's lead in because uh, you know it was, it was uh, perfectly matched. In fact, I know a lot of that country. My my and my nana was born in Rocky Bank, um, South Mitchell, and um, on on um, on a station in the late 1890s. Believe it or not. Um, so uh, that country is reasonably familiar to me as well. Um, but look, um, next slide, please. Um, the uh, I just want to run down a few things. The Brigalow Bell itself, a bit of the ecological history, uh, livestock impacts, the, the five big types of livestock impacts, what that does to us, nature bites back. Um, and, uh, and, and, the, and the terrible part of the story is that how most of this can be avoided um, and still have livestock production. Uh, but also at the end, alternative. Next slide, please. So um, here's the town of Brigalow. Um, it's the Brigalow uh, belt is that shown on the map at, at the right there. Uh, it's a large swathe of going from Townsville all the way down to Gundawindi. Um, and uh, it's the largest of the 13 bioregions of Queensland. Um, you've got subhumid to semi-arid dense forests and grassy woodlands. As Warren said, these bands, strips, it's not homogeneous at all. Um, and of course, it's named after the signature tree that with the silvery, the wattle with the silvery leaves called Acacia harborphylla. Next slide, please. Uh, Brigalow forests uh, have been cleared below 8% of their original extent. Um, and so those blank spots on the map, the white spots where Brigalow used to be, uh, and the black spots are where they're left. Um, and so there's only one big patch. You can see the big patch um, just um, southwest of Emerald is Castle Vale. It's actually a nature refuge. Uh, but right next to it, um, to the east of that, is one of the biggest clearing events in the history of Queensland, uh, Manchuan Downs, um, which is just north of Carnarvon National Park. Uh, of course, all of this clearing pretty much to, you know, over 90% for livestock pasture, which includes not just simply, you know, turning it, taking away the trees, but actually blade plowing it and putting in exotic pastures, exotic species of pasture. Uh, and Brigalow now is an endangered ecological community. Next slide, please. Um, so let's look at the first impact, which is grazing itself. Um, you get the removal of food, and so this should be an obvious one. Uh, the cows are competing with native wildlife for food. So here's one, just one example of many, the black throated finch um, in the northern, and there's the map underneath the finch of where it occurs uh, in the northern Brigalow Belt, Desert Uplands and Isley Uplands. Uh, it's an endangered bird now. Um, and grass seed sources are eaten by cattle. At, and the important thing is the vast scale at which this happens, of course. The, the cattle are, are on the landscape at a, at a vast scale. So 60% of the state of Queensland has got livestock on it. OK? Next slide. Um, the next effect of grazing is the removal of cover, leading to increased exposure and predation of native wildlife. Right? And that should be another obvious thing, too. Take away the grass cover, the ground cover. Um, you, you know, the animals that live there can no longer hide from predators. And, and just below that is an example, and you'll see these, the, that progression of columns going up. Well, that's the, the numbers of species of mammals in those different environments. Um, when it was stocked with livestock, um, one year after, two year after, and three year after removal of livestock, a meteoric increase in the mammal species richness just by taking away livestock, right? And that just shows you how powerful this impact is of livestock on, on uh, removal of cover. Next slide, please. The other thing that uh, the, the hoof of the cow does is, uh, as well as removing the ground cover, uh, they're also breaking up the soil surface and compacting it. So um, if we go to the next slide, that's, uh, that means that you get less rainfall infiltrating through the soil and more runoff on the soil. Okay, And that's uh, the next slide shows you well, we've seen an example of that in Nebian Creek, increased erosion. Uh, next slide. Uh, and that leads to sediment pollution. Um, and, of course, sediment pollution, next slide, leads to um, marine impacts. So, so not just the freshwater communities suffer, 
um, in those streams themselves, but also this gets washed out onto the Great Barrier Reef, where it's a major cause of, of, of biodiversity loss. Next slide, please. Now, and now, the, probably the biggest impact of, of livestock production is it's the main driver of tree clearing uh, in Queensland. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the graph showing how the areas of land cleared in Queensland, uh, and you'll see that U-shaped pattern. Uh, that's because there was a ban on broad-scale clearing came into play in 2006. Uh, it was going gangbusters until the government fell in 2012. Uh, and took the axe, in their own words, to the land clearing laws in Queensland. Um, those two colours, the first colour is, the top colour is regrowth. So that's stuff that could be knee high, but it could also be as high as, you know, up, up there. Uh, it depends how old it is, but it's called regrowth. Uh, and, and the denser colour is, is remnant. It's never been cleared before. It's mature forest, right? Uh, next slide. And so the, just looking at the mature forest that's been bulldozed, it, the, the rate of, of bulldozing of mature forest has increased five times in as many years, in five times in five years, as a result of the Newman government uh, taking the axe to the land clearing laws. But Revel Point, and of course, from EDO, is going to tell us a lot more about that later. Next slide, please. Um, so the equivalent, let's, let's just imagine this. If you've got two, 465 D9 bulldozers, about five metres wide in the blade, um, clearing a 2.3 kilometre wide strip from Brisbane to Cairns in just one year, that's how much is cleared. Okay, so you get a sense of just how vast this activity is in Queensland's landscape. Thank you. Next slide. Um, most clearing is in the Brigalow Belt and in the Mulga lands. So just south of the Brigalow Belt there, south and west is the Mulga lands. And those are the two big hotspots of, of land clearing in Queensland, Brigalow Belt and, Mul and Mulga lands. Next slide, please. Uh, over 90% of clearing in Queensland is for pasture or for livestock feed crops like sorghum, lucerne and so forth. Next slide, please. Uh, most of the tree clearing that happens, uh, I don't think I can play that video, but um, uh, there's no permit needed, no fauna, or has happened, no fauna survey or relocation is required. Um, the only requirement is to give notice and follow a very lax clearing code. So it's essentially exempt under Queensland law. Um, let's look at federal law. There's no compliance with federal law. The, the, we've just discovered that 300,000 hectares of threatened species habitats bulldozed in Queensland in the last three years not a single referral for approval under the Commonwealth legislation. Uh, and to make things worse, the Commonwealth don't enforce it. They take no action, right? Uh, codes and laws were tightened in by the Queensland Government in May of this year, but it remains to be seen what the impact of that is. Next slide, please. Let's look at some of the impacts of tree clearing. We obviously have the direct killing of wildlife. Uh, when the bulldozer goes through, it's killing, it's killing animals. Uh, you get destruction of habitat and that leads to death. So there's, you might die at the site, but then you've got nowhere to go or where you go is already occupied, so you end up fighting with existing wildlife um, and so you die. So we estimate 45 million mammals, birds and reptiles killed in just one year, for which we have data uh, in Queensland. Uh, and on top of that, you get the fragmentation of habitat that results, so the breaking up of the forest into patches, right? Um, and, and because of that breaking up, you have ongoing higher mortality of the animals that remain there in those remnants, right? They have higher mortality levels. And so that's why we get native species going towards extinction. Those two effects, losing habitat, but also the habitat that's left is broken up. Next slide, please. Um, and so we see uh, just in the State of the Environment report that came out uh, for 2016, uh, clearing and land use change is ranked by Australian ecologists as the number one threat to our native wildlife, right? Climate change is coming in at number two, invasive species and pathogens, number three. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, koalas, just think about koalas. Most people think the co problem with koalas is in southeast Queensland, and certainly the ag lobby like you to think that it's in southeast Queensland. But when we did the numbers, uh, we found that that's only a drop in the ocean of what's happening in Queensland. Because if you look at the rest of the state, koalas don't just occur in southeast Queensland. Koalas have always been uh, widespread in the state. They go all the way out to Charleville, all out to Townsville. Um, and when you look at the numbers dying, uh, which are estimates, I admit, but um, they've been accelerating too. And most of those deaths of koalas are not in southeast Queensland. They're out in the Brigalow Belt. Next slide, please. Uh, and let's think of, of what that means. Um, you know, this amounts to persecution of animals on a, on a mass scale. Um, so 
you know, we don't just get the death of animals, we get tremendous suffering of animals. And, and Scott, I believe, is going to be talking about welfare impacts uh, of production later. But, but this is probably the biggest crisis of animal welfare. And certainly the RSPCA agrees with me on this, uh, that um, all these animals are unseen. We don't know, we, can't, we don't see them. We're not, it's not like in an urban area where you get bush knocked over and you see the, the koalas running across the road and getting knocked by a car. Out, out, out of the Briglow Belt, nobody's seeing, nobody's seeing this, right? Um, so it's, it's invisible, it's hidden. Um, but there's a huge animal welfare crisis, animals suffering and dying uh, because of the destruction of the, and fragmentation of the habitat. Next slide, please. Um, here's something that's what we call directed. So that's undirected persecution. When you're knocking the forest down, you're only, your intention is to knock down the forest, not to actually kill the animal. That's a side product. But of course, there's a lot of direct persecution by the livestock industry, particularly of dingoes. Um, countless dingoes are trapped, shot and poisoned uh, just because they might attack stock. And there's a picture, which is all too common in Western districts, of dingoes strung up in a fence. It's kind of medieval, like putting you know, heads on a pike or whatever. Next slide, please. Uh, kangaroos are slaughtered en masse because they compete with stock for forage. Uh, and, uh, and this doesn't include those that are actually harvested for meat. So there's a section of kangaroos which are harvested for meat. This, this is, these are just damage mitigation permits. By graziers, just to shoot kangaroos to get rid of them, right? Um, and so hundreds of thousands of permits issued um, the, in the non-commercial take in Queensland. Next slide, please. Um, the persecution of dingoes uh, has profound conservation impacts because they're top of the food chain. Um, and the, 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 the removal of top predators is linked throughout the world, not just here, throughout the world is linked to the extinction of small mammals um, because of dingo persecution. Right? Uh, because it releases these exotic, what are called meso predators, middle level predators from control, and they decimate the smaller native um, wildlife. Next slide, please. Um, fencing has tremendous conservation impacts that, are, that are, are very little understood and very little studied. In fact, this study is back in 1999 as the last um, study I could find. Uh, barbed wire and traps, uh, gliders, bats, wading birds, night birds and birds of prey, and of course is ubiquitous uh, in grazing country. Next slide, please. Fencing also impedes migration and escape from predation and causes starvation. Um, so it's also a form of non-direct persecution of animals. And here's an amazing shot of emus uh, in Western Australia uh, coming up against the rabbit-proof fence uh, and trying to get through uh, during a drought. Thank you. Next slide. Um, water points. Uh, this is... Uh, so Warren talked about some of those goats. Uh, there's, those are goat tracks next to a, uh, a camping reserve. So again, we're a camping reserve with a tank out near Currawinia National Park. Um, and, and that's a perfect example of the fact, you know, if you put water where water never was, in the arid zone, particularly in the Simpson Desert, um, it has a lot of problems. It attracts alien species, horses, foxes and weeds. Uh, they can live there where previously they wouldn't have been able to live. And that decimates um, arid zone fauna that aren't used to having those animals around. So bilbies, for example, the late Peter McRae, the uh, late lamented Peter McRae, found that bilbies disappeared whenever a stock ball went in. Uh, so, the, you know, bilby health populations were healthy until the stock ball went in and then suddenly the bilbies disappeared. Uh, so water points. Next slide, please. Um, greenhouse pollution. Livestock methane equals 10% of national emissions. Um, so that's just from the cow, um, you know, uh, just from their rumen, from the digestion. Um, and that may be higher than, than they think, the recent research. Uh, and tree clearing is about 7%. So just the emissions from the livestock exceed the emissions from tree clearing. Um, both have been underestimated. Let's keep going. So next slide. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, this causes global climate change, which is linked to more uh, severe droughts. Next slide. Um, but also you get um, local climate warming and drying because of loss of tree cover. And this is a well-known um, geophysical effect of losing tree cover. And here's a, a well-known, should be a well-known farmer called Glenn Morris in, in Inverell saying, we are destroying this water cycle through widespread land clearing, particularly in Queensland. We need to start revegetation big time. Trees keep the landscape cool and mild, which encourages local rainfall. I couldn't have, physicists couldn't have put it better than a local farmer. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, so let's talk about minimising. Uh, you know, this is a disgraceful thing. All of these impacts can be minimised. Let's go on. Uh, next slide. Um, next slide. Uh, tree clearing, cattle can be and are run successfully in intact woodlands and forests, right? So that's the first thing. The amazing thing about livestock is you really don't need to cut down the trees to have a viable livestock operation, right? Livestock, that's, that's the whole point of livestock. They can be run in a natural landscape. 
Um, and of course, we have big retailers like Macca's now demanding deforestation-free production. Thank you. Next slide. Um, grazing and trampling, the solutions are very well studied and it's not rocket science. Just reduce your stocking rates, rest the paddocks and fence off riparian or other sensitive areas. Next slide, please. Um, livestock can be protected non-lethally with guardian animals. There's a lot of research on this now, um, particularly in Moremia's guardian dogs. Um, so dingoes don't really need to be persecuted. In fact, a lot of research is now showing that they, they benefit the grazier because they help keep the kangaroo populations down. They otherwise have to go and get a damage mitigation permit to shoot them all. Okay, next slide. Fencing. Wildlife safe fencing is well established. Um, it's very well known. Uh, of course, it's expensive, but it could be prioritised to areas where there's known uh, movements of vulnerable animals. Next slide, please. Uh, water points can be turned off when the paddock is rested and no stocks of presidents. And, and plus, you could leave areas of the property open, uh, closed to water points to preserve what's called now called water remote habitat. Next slide, please. Uh, greenhouse pollution is a bit, bit more difficult, but Meat and Livestock Australia have committed to uh, carbon neutrality by 2030. Good on them. I don't know how they'll do it, but good on them. Next slide. Um, so just a final slide here. Um, there are alternative revenue streams, and of course we heard Warren's amazing story about the kangaroo grass. Um, small footprint, high value dry land crops like sandalwood. Uh, kangaroo ranching, which George Wilson is going to be telling us about later. Uh, amazing piece of work. Outback ecotourism, and of course carbon sinks are all other sources of revenue that I mean you don't have to necessarily run stock. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Martin. Is there any questions from the panel, please? Oh, could I? Well, I personally am... I, I know this, but I'm devastated every time I see the, total, the totality of what this industry and we, what we, our culture has allowed to happen. You said 45 million animals in one year? That's a low estimate. I just want us to sit with that. 45 million animals in one year, dead or harmed, because of us wanting to eat beef and lamb. And that's uh, all the way from geckos, of course. I mean, every tree has a gecko. Um, all the way up to eagles and hawks, yeah. I've got no questions. I'm just disgusted with my culture. Appreciate that, Martin. It, uh, I mean, it, um not a very emotive person, but it certainly it's quite true when, um, when on the planet we actually, uh, just in domesticated animals alone, or farm animals, we cull six billion, over six billion animals just to food, mm. our, uh, to feed our intake um, as, as a population. And you talked about methane and, and um, mitigation activities. The question, I guess, getting to the question is why isn't this information getting out to the people that really need this information, like the general public? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, but more, more importantly, um, when we've got a set of well-identified mitigations that the industry itself can undertake, uh, and we see they are moving in some areas like, like um, carbon neutrality. Again, I don't know how they're going to do it, but good luck, um, at least thinking about it. Um, but Certainly, that's our view is, um, you know, all of this is avoidable. You don't have to be having this impact. You can still have a, a, a viable industry. You can have alternate industries, have a mixed economy. Um, why do we have to do it this way? Mm. Yeah, and certainly talking to industry is, is something we do as well. Mm. And Mary? Um, could I just say, um, it is unbelievably depressing <laughs> when you hear it in those sort of statistics and numbers and all that kind of stuff. Um, two things. I, I remember seeing a, um, oh, what was it, a, a documentary, I think, or some news or something about comparing, especially Queensland, with, um, I think, the situation in Brazil, the in unbelievable land clearing that goes on there, all for McDonald's, apparently. Yeah. Um, it, this, this place, the Queensland, is as bad as that, or worse, or is about the same? It, what about I, the other states? And then the other thing is that... Um, the, um, as you say, why can't this be... Uh, no, uh, I think Ross asked, why can't it be more well-known, especially the, through the media? Mm -hmm. If this was mm -hmm. put into the media, um, well, they wouldn't be allowed to, I suppose, because they're, they're the servants of, you know, corporations, <laughs> my own belief, anyway. Um, but, yeah, those two things. Well, I thank you for the question. And, and the, uh, you know, the, the fact is, uh, 
um, that yes, I'm the one who did the calculation, I admit, that um, shows that as a percentage of what's left, so the Amazon has a heck of a lot more left than we do, um, and so even though in absolute area they're clearing more in the Amazon e every year, as a percentage of what left, we are clearing more. Um, and so that's the difference is they absolutely clearing more, but as a percentage of what left, we are clearing more in Queensland, and that's why we got Queensland and New South Wales jointly because of the weakening of the legislation in both states uh, listed us on the WWF international list of 11 deforestation fronts we're most clearing and we are the only developed country on that list. Maybe one of the things we should consider is uh, changing the legislation to reflect um, more so because I mean the legislation at the moment says um, land clearing is, is what's, the, what's the word they use um, for improvements. Yes. Well, I'll let Revel, um, she's going to be, uh, Revel Poynton will be going through the legislation in quite a bit more detail, so I'll defer to her. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Martin. Your analysis and research is awesome. Thank you. Depressing, but awesome. <laughs>